All right. All right. What's going on? <laughs> What's going on, y'all? Uh, so let me share my project real quick. This is my project. It was uh, a website, e-commerce store where I sell stickers and apparel and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get my S3 bucket to really take my images. So it actually had like a nice card section for my stickers where it limited 10 per page. Um, but this is pretty much it. I have a sign in or sign up so it can take any user. So let's just say, you know, sign up and then you go to sign in and it reroutes to the front um i also have a cart where i'm pulling an api for a country and state so whatever country you're from you can just set the country and then it'll pull all the states from there as well um then i have a shop apparel's coming soon Ooh. apparel's coming soon I haven't launched anything for that yet. And then this is my stickers page, but obviously it's kind of blank. <laughs> um, and then if you click on here, I kind of want to do a carousel at first, but I didn't go with that route. I went instead with just these two dynamic things where this just takes you to my new items. But since I kind of have no items, <laughs> it's empty. And then it's a learn about us as well, kind of talking about who we are, what we want to do, what inspires us. And if you want to email us, you could email us through here. It pulls it up. Let's say that. And that's pretty much it. That's the project. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions for Jesus? No, there's some pretty cool animations. Shit. <laughs> as far as blockers, um, I obviously had a Google Auth blocker and a Stripe blocker. Uh, for the Stripe, I had to set up the HTTPS, but by the time I deployed, I was already kind of having issues with that. I wasn't going to have enough time to fully do the implement the Stripe API. Um, with Google Auth, I learn from the get-go to not use any third-party libraries because they definitely don't work. They don't work for me at all. Um, I try to even fall into Google development, like console process of use, of doing everything from scratch. It didn't work with me. And I'm not sure if that's just something I'm doing wrong or if that's just a Django with reacting that's kind of just fidgety. Um, I know somebody who got it working in 30 minutes with just using just straight React. And I was pretty upset about that. So. All right, cool. Yeah, the 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 third party OAuth stuff is definitely uh, a pain. So, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Cool. Very nice. Yeah, and then there are also restrictions. You know, it, you mentioned HTTPS. So mm -hmm. for certain things, um, you have to have HTTPS, uh, which means that you have to have a domain, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. That's also something to to keep in mind when you wanna when you wanna do do something. Um, look looking at all of the other dependencies. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll go down. Uh, Tyler is next here. You're uh, muted if you're. Um, this is my application taste bud. So you have your login uh, landing page here. You can move over to the sign up. Make a new account, brings you back to login. Um, this is the only home page we really have. It's our search recipe screen. It's powered by Edamom here. Uh, up here, you can use single or multiple keywords. Um, I guess for my example, I was going to do shawarma, but they don't have very many shawarma recipes, so we're, we're going to switch it up. Let's do a... I bet they got some good buffalo wings one. 
So we'll do Buffalo wings. And then you also have the option of coming through on this health filters. You can select multiple. Um, so, you know, you can add as many of those as you want. But then in cuisine type, these are just like what part of the world the food's coming from. Meal type is like, you know, just uh, what time you should have it. And then dish type is uh, just if it's a pasta, sandwiches, main course, all of that kind of stuff. So you're going to enter all of these filters that you want. And then when you hit search, brings up some recipes. Uh, so you can glance through and just get a little basic information from these. But if you wanted to, say, click on them, now you will pull up the nutrition facts here that I got plugged in. Uh, you can see your ingredients, what diet, any health tags it might have, any caution tags it might have, um, what the recipe is, who made it. And then they don't display the instructions for copyright reasons because the recipes are coming from an API. So I have to hit instructions and it just reroutes you to um, the recipe itself. Uh, you can close this to come back to the Buffalo Wing page. Um, or you can come back up here at the top and hit back to search just to get back to the search screen here. Um, and the only other feature really besides that is just being able to log out and back onto the landing page. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Any questions for Tyler? I just have a comment. I think it's really cool that you saved the search even coming back to the page after you've already looked at the results so you can edit that and not have to remember where you were at <laughs> thank you how did you do that um i have my when i do the api call it just gets saved uh under a state of recipes and then even when i click into um when i click into the recipe let me see if I can get back on there real quick. When I click into the recipe, um, so each of these just have the index of each of the recipes or like the information for the recipe. And then I just take that information for the recipe and I push it over to this card. Um, but when I hit back to search, yeah, it's just uh let me let me go see if I can find it real quick, maybe. I don't think it'd be too hard um back to search and it's on the detailed uh close um on close mm -hmm. You know, close details. Yep. So when I when I close it, uh, the recipe I just said the one that you are okay. Here here's a good way to explain it. Um. So when you're on this screen, you have just all your recipes generated. When you click on it, you're just grabbing that recipe and um, you're setting it as a single recipe. And then if that single recipe is true, then it renders this page instead. Um, and then when you close it, it just sets that single recipe back to null. So it renders all of the recipes again. So it's just a conditional rendering on if you have a single recipe selected out of the list or if you just don't have, or if you just have the whole list still. Pretty much. Cool. Hopefully Thanks. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How did you do the multiple filters? Uh, multiple filters. Let me share again. so i have a, a state called query parameters here and if we come back out to my app we can actually see where that gets originated at um all right it's actually not my thing so i have these query parameters here q is your custom search Health is a list of all those health ones, cuisine type, meal type, and dish type. Um, and so when you set one of these, it'll just set like dish type to that correct dish type, cuisine type to the correct cuisine type. And so I just track all of this. And then when you go to hit the endpoint, um, I'm just using the endpoint and then the base URL. 
Oh, that's sign up. I'm going to come down here and recipe search. This one makes more sense. So I'm using the base URL. Uh, the That's just the rest of the endpoint. And then the query string is just going to be, I'm mapping through the keys of my object. If it's an array, I'm mapping through the array and returning each of those, um, which is just for health. All the other ones are just going to, should be only be a single string. Uh, and then I put it all together in the query string here. Um, so I just put the question mark in front automatically because I have to have a query. If I, I guess I should have showed that. I didn't show that, I don't think. I'll show it on the way out. Um, if you try to search without anything, it would just won't let you search. You have to have some kind of parameter to search. Um, so if you don't, the question marks, it's just got to be mandatory here. And then it'll just put all your... Uh, you know, uh, Q equals blank and health equals blank, all your query parameters. And then on the view end of it, um, I'm just grabbing all those query parameters out of that URL, um, passing in my application ID, application keys into the query parameters here. And then if the query parameter exists, then I'm adding it to this query parameter. And then I'm, again, rejoining it again and hitting it onto the API. So same kind of endpoint I hit my backend with. I'm just hitting the API again with from the backend. And then it returns those recipes. Um, I guess there's... Uh, there it is. So if I clear this and I try to search, uh, please specify at least one keyword or filter before searching. So I just won't let you do anything if you haven't at least got some kind of filter up in here. And then once you have a single one, now you're just good to go. And you can clear all your filters. Oh, I guess I show that too. You can individually clear your filters or you got a clear button. Nice. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Chris, you're up next. Morning, everyone. Can you see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is my application. It's called Recapify. Um, quick summary, it just transforms audio files into summaries allows you to store the transcripts and summaries. And it also allows you to customize on how you want the transcript and the summary. Uh, the third party API I'm using is Assembly AI. Um, I have a sign up and a login here, just basic authentication. Um, go ahead and log in. All right, and this is the nav bar, which allows you to create a recap. So once you once you created it, automatically saves it to the to the back end. Um, and I have four boxes here. The um, transcript and the summary also get saved to the back end once you recapify it. Um, the first steps for the user is to either input a URL um, of an audio file or upload one. Uh, today I'm using TED Talk. How to sense how your sense of smell helps your savor flavor helps you savor flavor. So. Uh, use case, you can go to share. You can either download the audio file or copy the link here. Um, so I'll just go ahead and upload it. One second. Actually, I'll just take the link. It's probably quicker. What's going on? All right. 
let's just use the URL because I don't know where that file went. So can copy that. I'm not sure if that's going to work. It's not the... Here, I'll just go ahead and download it again. So typically you'd want like a point or a dot mp3 file for the link. It would have, the end of it would have to be a audio file, but. Cool, are there, uh, so it, it can be any audio format? Yeah, there's like a list of 25 that yeah. Assembly AI uses. I just didn't put it in here for the user yet. Cool. Yep. Upload. So what this does is this sends this file to Assembly AI and they send you back a link for that file, which is this. And then here's customize. So the two options uh, right now is summary and highlights. Uh, for the summary, it's the type. So you can do a, a paragraph or bullets. Um, we'll do a, a paragraph. The model is informative or conversational. And this is just basic highlights that the AI generates of this the, uh, transcript. There's a handful more that you can use with this API. So if you guys ever use it. And then it recaps it. Are there uh, limits, like file size limits? I set it on uh, Nginx to 20 megs. Yeah, um, I'm not too sure with the API though. Okay. So um, first thing I did is put in the confidence level of this transcript. And then I highlighted the, the highlights that, um, was sent back to me in the transcript. And then the summary. This is only a three and a half minute video, so um, summary is a little short. The transcript, but the uh, the highlights do seem a little vague. I've noticed with this. I don't know if it's like the free API version, but. Yep, so once this is finished, both of these transcript and summary get saved to the back end. So you can create another one. And then go back to recap and it'll fetch it from the back end. Um, the confidence and the highlights were late features, so I didn't have time to actually save those to the back end too. But yeah, that's it. All right, nice. Is there anything uh, especially difficult about using this API or handling audio? Um, no, not necessarily. There's so many features that it was tough trying to pick which ones I wanted to use. But other than that, it was fairly, it was, it was kind of straightforward. Um, no crazy hurdles. Cool. And the, wh where does the file actually get uploaded to? So the file, yeah. So it. once you click upload, it, it sends it to assembly AI and they send you back like a designated link. And then that's what I use the generated link. I send it back to assembly AI and they send me the transcript and summary. If you were to use just a URL, you wouldn't have to do that. It would I have it generated here and then you could just click recapify. Okay, cool.
All right. Very nice. Any questions for Chris? What was the name of that API again? It is Assembly AI. Mm -hmm. I was going to use Chad GPT, but actually Chad was looking around and, and while we were going over some things and found this one. Nice. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. And let's see. Oh, this list keeps moving around. Uh, let's see. Corey. So my app is a solar system with the little styrofoam ball planets diorama. Classic. If this were a science fair, it's not nearly as exciting. Uh, it's a patterned after a government uh, app that we use at work, so it's not pretty anyway. Uh, basically, it lists projects. Uh, you can either, right now, you can create a project or you can list the projects. Ultimately, uh, you want to be able to select projects. So I've got the, uh, so the, the mouse the, pointer to. If I could just share a quick. So, so this is something that you would use for your actual job, right? I would use this for the actual job. So you click on this, it would launch a modal. The modal would just be the, the document review, and then you can just cancel the modal out, and you're still on the main screen. You can create your, I'll do another one like that. File, file, there we go. On it, eventually it'll go back to this thing, list it. And so it went to one because I refreshed the, uh, refreshed the screen earlier. So this is the dev version. The, as you can see over here, the uh, EC2 went fine. Uh, it really does not like run compose uh, prod for some reason. So I've been working on that to get that to work. I uh, just, it hates it. Absolutely hates it. But uh, uh, I'll figure that out at some freaking point. But uh, that's, uh, anyway, I won't. I won't bore you with the uh, the non details of this one, but all right. Well, thank you. So actually, uh, so from all these beautiful apps we've been seeing, yeah. Well, you know, beautiful is nice. Sometimes you have specific requirements, and you need to design something to suit a particular use case or a particular customer's requirements. So, yeah. I'm a big believer in beautiful. So I think that it should still be pleasant to look at and pleasant to interact with, regardless of its function. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I, I agree. But there's also, you know, the reality of software development is that you're almost always developing something for someone who's paying for it, <laughs> or who you hope doesn't want to pay for it in government. So. Yeah, actually, uh, Tiffany, I remember Tiffany's personal project was a similar kind of thing. Cool. Yeah, it's actually, um, so most people's personal projects are, you know, I just want to do X, but occasionally, uh, you know, it's for like, okay, I have, I want to create a tool, like, you know, an, an internal tool, maybe that I could use uh, at work. And that's also pretty cool. All right, thank you very much. All right, so uh, next up is 
طبعا My app is really simple. It's just uh, uploading a would-be recipe. So this is the uh, login page for register. So we we'll just create a quick user. Whoops. I, had, I thought I had it set up so it would reroute once it logged in, once I had a token, but it just doesn't do that, but it's fine. So uh, there's one recipe here. This is my nav bar. I tried to put a little image, a footer, and it's pretty simple. Um, you can add a recipe so we can go and do like a, I don't know, cookies. Um, Pick one of these. Right. It. <clears throat> Take you back to the home screen, and then you can these. This heart one is not active. It's supposed to be a a like, but uh, my user profile on my back end doesn't necessarily have a, a like. It just has a my recipe right now, but. I'll, I'll put it there eventually. But this works. The information, you know, you get some detailed information. It's not. So you can also click on my recipes and it'll pull up all the users' recipes, which I, I really liked the feature from Django where you can um add like a like, like this is on the user profile. This is my recipe. So when I go through the back end, I filter basically through all the users. So I use Django's or ORM. It filters through all the users and then pulls the recipes. So I thought that was kind of like that. Uh, and then this is my Tasty API, which has been a little bit janky, but works. Um, so you can click on one of the images and it's, this is all the information I'm pulling up. I was trying to pull up more information yesterday, but I just kept running into issues with um, either my uh, the container wouldn't start because there was a change in my front end and it said that, you know, this component that you've updated or this component that you've imported has not been exported. So I tried to, you know, fix that and whatever, but, uh, didn't work. but this is, this is it. This is my app. That's it. Cool. Very nice. So if you were going to implement the the like the like feature how do you how do you think you might go about that yeah that's it I, I was curious so I think in that I was thinking that I would make the uh right because you I was thinking that I could make my likes an array and then when you were to click on that button it would like put an x in that array Right. And then that like number would be the length of that array. Maybe I would display that. I, I don't know, but that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you could display the like the number of times that this yes. has been like. Yes. Cool. Nice. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for some of that you you definitely could use an array. You could also create a separate table and then join it and get like a account so you could you could aggregate the the data there cool very nice uh let's see who we got next uh harry good morning everyone can all can all of you see my screen yes so this is my uh, application. Uh, this is a problem that I encounter a lot in my job as a psychologist. And is essentially we provide patients with many screenings to kind of like 
have a filter for those we want to refer for services and those who might be okay. Um, as many of you know, I work for the Veterans Hospital, uh, so I want to make it practical to my work. The screening that we're gonna uh, that I chose is the one that that we use the most, the PHQ nine. It uh, triggers uh, or an alert if you think that someone um, might be depressed. Um, a screening very quickly is not a dia diagnostic tool, right? Just because you hit a certain thre threshold on a screening doesn't mean that you it's not a diagnostic, diagnostic you know, evaluation. It's just like a little filter to say, hmm, maybe we should talk to this person a little bit more and see if they need extra help. So as you can see on the initial uh, page, when you go to my app, we have uh, two APIs that I'm calling one for the uh, time and one for the weather. Um, there was uh, there was another API that I initially wanted to uh, call and it works locally. So I'm working on that, but I found a solution uh, that I think is a little bit better because uh, sometimes, you know, you overcomplicate things and you can make them super simple. So let's register a new user. Let's say that Harry zero, let's say Harry 10. He is from my hometown, um, which, and, and this information I'm asking here, the zip code, but it's just going to go to the back end. I'm not doing anything with that information other than storing it because eventually I would like to use it maybe with the VA's APIs. They, they have their own API, so let's register. So as you can see, register, registration successful. You get a little alert. Um, obviously, I put a very silly password. So now I'm going to log in. So the first thing you see on your um, dashboard is this. Um, so once you take a depression screening, you'll see your history there. So my intention is that it can list when did you take it and whether the score was positive or negative. I don't want to disclose to the user necessarily, oh, your score, your score is 10 or your score, your score is 20. Like, no, just positive, negative, keep it, keep it simple. Um, so now let's go and take a questionnaire. So I'm gonna say that the, you know, today I woke up, the weather is kind of silly, but I woke up perfectly fine. My mood over the last two weeks have been great. So I go and it says, oh, your depression screening is negative. No further action is needed, right? So not, not, nothing needs to happen. Now I see the score, the, um, I can see my, my results here. Let's take another one and make this person, they have not been doing well. Um, so I, uh, not at all, this is zero. This is one, two, three, right? That's the and if you do 10 or more for a score, you trigger a positive response, right? So let's trigger a positive one. This will be, I think this will be enough. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this questionnaire before, if you ever receive services at the VA or any hospital, this is not a tool that it's used in healthcare. It's very, very standard. Um, now um, here you can see, oh, your screen is positive. So let's find you some, uh, you know, resources near you. So this is the part that I wanted to do with my Google API. And locally, I got it to list uh, certain clinics, but for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work here last night. And I had to change my priorities to deploy, uh, which I was able to do. I'm very happy with that. So um, I can go and say, hey, you know what? Let's see what's close to me. And of course, like the VA has already, you know, so, so I think this is nicer, right? Like if, if this was a real app, then I would rather send the use here to the, to the page of the VA. So the other thing that I wanted to, I'm oh, sorry, this is my local one. Um, I'm gonna go back to my dashboard. Now I can see this result, but one more thing that I wanna show you is that there's another condition, right? So there's negative result, positive result. But if you go to the questionnaire, uh, I'm gonna trigger another positive one. 
But this time I'm going to add the last question is very serious. It's about thoughts of hurting yourself, suicide, right? So we want to make sure that if we're asking that to someone, we're doing something about it, right? It's not someone, someone has that issue. Um, then it gives you an extra line where it says, hey, you know, you have thoughts of being better off dead or thoughts of hurting yourself. Like maybe you should consider suicide prevention. So then I send you to this page where you can have resources on where to call, who to talk to if you're feeling that way. Um, and when I return to the dashboard, I can see that here. I'm not commenting on anything like that. Oh, you were suicidal like last week. Maybe I don't want to have that there, but more like a history. Um, and of course, you can log out from the application. And that's my my application. I I think my biggest, biggest hurdle was that thing with the Google API. Maybe it has to do something with Google wanting, wanting HTTPS because everything was the same on my, uh, like, um, on my uh, Docker Compose files, like everything. So that that was that was a big big challenge. Um, what else? I, and in the future, I think that this is of interest to me because I was, for example, doing a, an evaluation this week for a patient that was going to have like gastric bypass surgery, and some of the some of the questionnaires and screenings and testing that we use is not automated. So it would be nice that so the VA already has some that we can send a patient they fill them up and I'm good to go when I want to write my report so it would be nice to add some that are not automated that are not used as commonly like the ones for like very niche uh, uh, assessment so yeah that's that's my app thank you so much thanks any questions for Harry uh Curious about the uh the API. So you wanted to use the Google API to get just a list of addresses. yeah. Let me yeah. Let me show you very quickly. Sorry, uh, like because I think I have the local the local host running. It doesn't look as nice as actually sending them to the VA page, but I'm gonna show you what what I was able to do. Second. This is my lo local one. Yeah, this is my local one. So if I go here very quickly, log in, um, let me create another user. Trigger one. So this is how I got it to look like, but this is using Google API. So now it's going to load in a second. I think it's, I think uh, you see like this is, so this buttons don't do anything, uh, but I would have liked to kind of like then go to the next step of getting a list of, you know, details on this location. So all I can see is the names and not everything is clinics, right? Because like, this is other like, you know, I, I know this building because I used to work here. So this is a clinic. Um, so it's kind of like not as specific as as just sending them to the to the page, but um this is, you know, this is this was one of the biggest hurdles. Okay, cool. So are you uh are you getting that you're making that request from your back end? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, that should be uh, solvable, but yeah, very nice. Thank you. Ooh, um, let's see. I think uh, Joyce. Hi. Um, let me pull my stuff up. Oh, 
Oh no, hold on. Okay, so um this is my homepage. Um I had a lot of issue trying to inject API key into the API, uh, the Google API map. But um, originally I was, ho I was hoping to add more function to the API map, but um, this is basically dropping a king, uh, ping at like uh, Virginia area. And it's just like, you can see the very basic map, that's all. Yeah, and um, I, I think I'm already logged in, but let me log out first. And then we can log in. And so this is the main page where like you can add your trip detail and we can say, um, where else do it? Uh, okay. And And basically you can add the trip and you'll see that it's added here. I should probably change the color a little bit on this side. It's not very clear, but once you click here, um, I'll come here and kind of, that's the next thing I want to figure is like how to grab the location from uh, this, uh, this part and then let it show on here. But um, yeah, it's a very, bare bone website. I'm still, I still, I, I ran out of time working on the stuff I want to do. Yeah, but that's basically it. Okay, very cool. Thank you. I think there are, uh, I think there are tools you could use for contrast checking. I think this kind of falls under uh, accessibility. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think there are some tools you could use you could just probably feed your, maybe even do a static, like static code analysis um, and see if there's ways you can adjust the CSS. Yeah, I definitely want to keep uh, working on it. So cool. I, can Thank see you. I can fix it. Yeah. Thank you. Has anyone? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Joyce, for your background image, was that just in your assets folder? Uh, to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> Right. I just I was looking at images. I was like, "Oh, this one is pretty." I had one. I had one in my assets. Yeah, and when I pushed it to AWS, it didn't work. But I just didn't put any in attention to it at all. It just wasn't worth it. So I was like, "Yeah, I won't worry about that later." So yeah, when I was trying to pull it directly from asset, it also didn't work for me. So I actually am linking to the URL directly. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. Cool. Hmm. So. Oh yeah, I tried leaflet, but I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'll probably need to spend more time playing with it. Leaflet. Yeah, leaflet is another open source uh map, but I was try I read through their tutorial and the um the doc, but I I I don't know. I think I'm, I I did something wrong. So yeah, but it's it's also pretty good. Nice. Yeah, that, that's good to know if there are other. I mean, Google obviously totally dominates the, the market there. But yeah, if there's other tools or APIs that, that are useful or easy or anything like that. Cool. Thank you very much. And next up, we've got Ken. Uh, already, y'all. This is my landing page. Uh, it's basically a website for coin roll hunting, where you can like log your finds, but also you get like points for everything. Um, here, I just have like a couple links to different pages, which are just these two right here. Uh, this kind of gives you like a 
how it all works. And then this gives you like a, a scoring rubric. Um, <clears throat> this page isn't finished yet, but you can basically uh, go here. Um, here, we won't add any yet. We could pick some different coinage. And then our score is tallied as we as we add. So we can just keep adding stuff. Maybe let's add one of these. And then I have a separate um, page where you can actually view the coin and it's getting the API is really slow, but it's getting uh, coin data um, from the PCGS API, which is Professional Coin Grading Services. And got a little back button. The information um, is saved because I, I put it in use context. And I can also delete. Um, uh, it's not updating the score. There's still some bugs to work out. But then I can finish logging. Uh, but I have to enter a dollar amount. And then they'll show up on my profile. Um, total dollar value search plus the whatever score you have. And I can delete it from here as well. Um, it kind of bummed me out that this is white. This used to be the same color as all this other stuff. But for some reason, uh, when I deployed it, it didn't recognize my styling. So, <clears throat> yeah, and that's about it. Cool. Very nice. Thank you. Um, uh, so what what would you have done had so it, this is a very like niche API, right? There's only one of them, maybe. So what what would have happened if this API doesn't exist? I think it would have been a lot of uh, either a different project idea or a lot of just like handwriting data. <clears throat> so the way that the API is like the where I'm getting all my coin data is from this API, this new Mista, which is a different one than the, the PCGS API I was using, but it doesn't have all the stuff I want in it. So like I, I basically had to write a Python script um, to like inject data into um, this API data that I was getting. Um, so yeah, I basically had to make it to where I could seed my database with um, using fixtures and providing a primary key and specifying the uh, model <clears throat> that it was tied to. Um, and it kind of made it not very ideal because I, I would have set my database base up way different. And because it wasn't really set up the way I would have liked it to be, I ran into some, um, some issues with getting data and I think the whole like structure of my database is kind of janky but um, but the a lot of time that I had this is all I could make happen I guess cool so you, you use one API basically to seed a database mm -hmm. to seed your database and then you combine that information like at the moment someone requests something from a, a, a different API. Yeah, so I like um, I use this one API, but I'm not actually calling this API anywhere in my code. I just literally just copied all the information. Um, and then I wrote a script to like transform it into like a JSON format. And the, uh, the other API that I'm using, let's find a good example here. I basically had to go um, gather these numbers, like not all of these have PCGS cert numbers because you have to like go to eBay and search the coin and then get the, the cert number off of the coin holder. Um, and there's not like cert numbers for all coins, but also like the PCGS API, like that's the only way I could figure out how to get a single coin information. There's no like filter of like this year, this type of coin, yada, yada. It's basically like you have to have the certification number in order to get any data back from them. So that was kind of a uh, limiting, I guess you could say. So by the way, this kind of problem is what 
what uh, data engineering is for. <laughs> nice. So if you if this were like you know part of a big, you, you would have a a data engineering team getting these different sources of data and then running them through you know different pipelines and transformations to get some final product that could be used just by like scraping or something. Yeah, I mean that's that that's definitely one thing you can do. So you, you can have you know data can come from from anywhere, come from all, all kinds of different sources. And that that's part of the you know part of what data engineering is is taking all kinds of data from different sources and then processing it and making it usable for someone else, you know. Yeah, I think that was my biggest limiting factor was the uh, since it's so niche, the data just wasn't readily available. So I had to kind of create my own in whatever means possible. All right. Thank you. Where did uh where did you get all your little icons from, Ken? They all look super clean. Uh I just went to some website and said like free icon generator. I don't even remember the actually it's right here. And then did you just like to do the color? The color, I used one of those websites that you showed me with the color palette generator thing. Because mm -hmm. I'm colorblind. So I'm, mm -hmm. I just like picked some colors that looked good. And I was like, all right, I'm sticking with them. <laughs> Does, uh, did you have to like declare the color for the icons in CSS or? No. So when you generate the icon, um, it'll give you an option to um, use whatever like hex color you want. Gotcha. Yep, yep. All right. Thank you. Let's see who we got. Uh no. Next. Hello. Is that showing the right screen? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I made the dog park. Uh, there's a, a sign up. You would be like, um, Ted, uh, you sign up, save it, and then you can log in. Uh, you get to the dog park, you get, uh, pick your profile, uh, get, change your name. Uh, you could add a dog. So, uh, I got the autofill links. I just added a bunch of these in. <laughs> uh, you can pick the age, uh, description, just like a uh, large fluffy dog. You can add it and you have your dog there with your default dog. Uh, this image is actually in public, not in assets. And that's how I got to work for me. And then uh, you could Pick your traits. So you could be like a large dog, fluffy, you know, not neutered, uh, dislikes, I don't know, small dogs, aggressive. You could update that and they pop up there. Uh, you could upload a photo. Uh, this takes like five seconds. Okay. Um, boom, you got your little dog there. Uh, and then you can go to parks. Uh, it's got the weather, the temperature, and the if it's raining or not. Uh, you could search, I believe. Yep, still works. It's always good. Uh, you can click the park, and then you can see all the other dogs there. And then it does a comparison. So it checks all the dogs currently in the park and checks their traits against your dislikes and your dislikes against your traits. So it'll be like, watch out for Chester because he doesn't like uh, large dogs. And then you could uh, add your dog. And there he is now. You remove him. Uh, you can show the park on the map. So that just goes to a Google API, pulls up the dog park. Uh, a little, yeah, what Google has. <laughs> Uh, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, parks, profile, get as many dogs as you want. That's about it. All right, very nice. 
Uh, I'm curious, how did you implement the, the like trait checking? Uh, the trait checking is uh, is, uh, trait check boxes. So traits are actually in the back end. Uh, traits model. So it's just trait name, and then it's a uh, many to many uh, dislikes and traits. So it's there twice from dog. So it's all the same. And then uh, I just loaded in the traits with the fixtures. And then uh, trait checks boxes gets all the traits and maps them. Uh, so it's just a checkbox. Uh, let me... Yeah, there's, it just maps a bunch of checkboxes and it loads that. Uh, So dog traits is what I passed in. So I pull that up when uh, you get your dog and you click on it and then passes it in to here. And then, uh, so if the checkbox is checked, then it adds it. So it takes all the previous traits and adds the selected one. And then uh, if you uncheck it, it does a filter and checks to see if the trait ID is in there and then it removes it. And then uh, that's, Um, that passes back to uh, the update page. And then when you hit update, it updates it. So I had the key. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. So for each trait in the state, then I push in the trait ID. And then I just, uh, I just send the post request with all the trait IDs and it updates it completely. Just replaces whatever there was there with what I put in. Yeah. All right, cool. Any uh any other questions? So I was actually trying to ask about how you did the the trait comparison. So if you're in a dog park, right? Oh. My dog likes this but doesn't like that. How do you how do you handle that? It was a, a bunch of JSON or J, uh, JavaScript logic. Okay. okay cool. <laughs> so I just uh, searched all the dogs in the park. I made sure it didn't check my own dog. So if you have two dogs, it doesn't check itself. Uh, and then for each trait of the dog's traits, I checked if it, my trait was in their problems or their problems were in my traits. And then I made a unique list and then uh, made an array, set the array up there and then down here. Uh, more logic, but uh, yeah. <laughs> For each uh, dog and the problem dogs, it puts the image in the name, and then space is a uh, actually just a space bike. <laughs> cool. Figure out how to get space. <laughs> could you could you scroll up um to that first function? This yeah. One? Okay. So someone else, what's the what's the runtime complexity <laughs> of check for problems? O of n squared. Yeah. So why is it O of n squared? It's a for loop in a for loop. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. Uh, Phil. All right. Is that showing my uh, app login? Yes. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna just log in with this one since I I already have a bunch of cool Pokemon, but this uh takes you to your login page or your your Pokemon page, and you can see the moves that any of your Pokemon have. Um. And then you can select one to use for battle, basically. So we can we can do like Charizard. And then if we go to the battle page and click fight, we'll fetch an enemy. 
Um, this guy, I think I was in the middle of a battle and and left. So he still has the same health he did um, since I didn't hit run. Um, and then I've got the tech set up. So like, I'll probably lose this battle because Blastoise is uh, water Pokemon and Charizard is uh, fire. So it should be getting hit really hard. And then his attacks will say that they're super effective and mine will say that they're not very effective. Um, and then like if I lose this battle, uh, I'm going to lose this Pokemon too. So uh, now if I go back to my Pokemon, let's see, I don't have Charizard. I might have a Charizard, but not the Charizard we were just using. Um, then... If I go back to battle, I can keep battling. Um, or if I, I guess I'll do one more attack. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to kill him. We'll try and get attacked again. Um, because we have a shop, so I can go to a shop and filter. We have like the money that we're earning from our battles, and then we can filter our items by like lowest, uh, highest value in the shop. And then you can buy uh, whatever this item is. And then if we decide to use it, I'm just going to use this one because I can't scroll all the way down with the zoom buttons. Um, it'll say that we gained some defense because I guess that was a defense item. I like purposely didn't label the items so that you have to kind of try them out and figure out what items, you know, do what for um that in the shop um you'll see that items quantity has gone down i basically put a like function that generates a random number when you get a new pokemon so every time you're fetching a new pokemon uh, pretty much if you generate a number over like 70 then uh you'll refresh the store quantities but um if you just happen to be buying up everything in the store. Uh, yeah, eventually you'll run out of some items um, until you get that refreshed. And then I didn't add any filters to the items. Um, and the animations are kind of the, the outer color is supposed to, or I guess I think I have it messed up on here, but the, the outer color is supposed to be the um, the Pokemon type, which I think the green stripes are the grass for um, Venusaur. But yeah, I, I did like the animations pretty much as just like placeholders for now because um, I'd like to do a bunch of animations with like each type and stuff, but I ran out of time. All right, very nice. Uh, I'm curious, did you use any any libraries for this? Like uh, maybe uh, game specific libraries? Um, no, I used a uh, Framer Motion um for React for uh styling like the divs for like the health and experience bars for like playing, um, and then that library also handles the uh the animations basically but you could do the animations and i guess regular css um but framer motion just makes it like convenient to where you can just uh wrap whatever it is that you're trying to animate in a div and then just give it the the props of like where you want it to start and where you want it to end and like the duration Any questions? Yeah, I'm kind of curious on how does it generate the enemy? Uh, when we generate the enemy, it's just a use effect calling um, our back end. Let me get a features.
I just reorganized everything. So sorry, I think we actually are gonna go to my trainer route. Um, so we have this fetch enemy function. And basically it checks we have the enemy Pokemon stored in state. Um, and uh, when we defeat an enemy Pokemon, it'll get set to null. So it, like it'll check basically that we don't have an enemy Pokemon. And then it'll go ahead and hit our back end. And our back end just takes a query. But basically on the back end, we... We're really just selecting a random Pokemon from the existing like Pokemon, like out of a, like the 151 that were in like red and blue and yellow or whatever. And then from that, like based on the like average level of the Pokemon that you have as a trainer, like the user doesn't really see that side of it, I guess. Um, but it generates stats to level them up until then. So like I have like a while loop that runs like a level function and like until they meet, I guess, the threshold of the level that you should be fighting against, um, it's just going to level up the enemy Pokemon until they do and then give you that Pokemon um, on the front end. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, nice. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's just not randomly picking one. Well, it's it's randomly picking out one, and then the database is just running a like a class method until gotcha. until a certain condition is met, basically. Nice. Um. Yeah, and then logout uh takes you to whatever page and if we like now sign up as somebody new we'll only have one pokemon it's a, it's, and then if we get a like battle we should i don't know this might actually be messed up uh and uh, that seems reasonable okay all right great thank you very much and then anyone else not we get everyone unfortunately no oh to me okay great to me well sorry the names keep getting shuffled around i think filler should have won last but that's okay um where is my <clears throat> okay oh nope actually which screen can you guys see i don't even uh you've got a knowledge hut browser oh nope <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys see a little Dead Sea December with a little yep. image in the Okay, great. So um my idea was to create like a centralized site and you know, maybe in the future an application where people who travel to certain locations um you know have somewhere to go to to kind of see what's going on during your time there. That was the big idea, um, I have my local here as well, just because I could not get all my functionality onto like EC2. I tried, it just could not get it on. Um, but okay, so if you try to log in, um, hold on. If you try to log in uh, and you don't have an account, it'll give you an alert saying it's invalid credentials. So, you have to sign up first and my stuff is freezing now, of course. Go away, yeah. Okay, so sign up. It doesn't wanna work for me. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's the uh, demo god. So uh, doing live demos is always very like high risk. You basically never want to do live demos um, <laughs> of anything. I'm yeah, we're we're doing it because it's it, it's a good experience and uh, I just did this. this fear will make me stronger, but uh, yeah, it's more like a uh, okay. Anyway, when you sign up, 
when you're supposed, supposed to happen is it's supposed to take you to this home page. And um, actually, the coolest thing I probably found out out of this was like messing with tail and CSS. I, I actually enjoyed it, enjoyed CSS for the first time, to be frank. Um, like just something as simple as like changing my pointer to a cursor and having um, like the circle kind of illuminate as you go through the dates and just able to like have functionality on here. So essentially it just has the calendar and um, I did December because that's like when I go to Nigeria and you know, there's usually events and stuff going on. It's always hard to find out what's happening, but essentially the idea was once you click a date, it will have an image. And I just generated a regular image from um, like one of this um, movie APIs I could find. Um, and then it just has the details here at the bottom. And as you go, it kind of changes based on the day and stuff. And so um, that's, that's pretty much the main functionality. And um, the stretch goal for me was to have to add like a post where you can actually post your details and have it populate on that day as well. And then implement like a like ranking system, um, but did not get there. And then I have like an events page. Um, Oh my goodness, here we go. Why are you not working, bro? Yeah, so my events page is not working, but it was basically just, it's just all my events in my database populated to the screen and then my logout. And yeah, I think my computer is frozen. Let me give you one more try. Yeah, it's not frozen, but yeah, I'm able to get it. Okay, but basically, yeah, that was the idea, just to click and have the different days pop up and the events that were have been registered for that day pop up to the screen, and that's pretty much it. And yeah, I think my computer is actually freezing because now I can't click my dates. But yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, very nice. So uh, how did you get the calendar? Yeah, so I use Tailwind CSS. Um, I actually found well through the Tailwind website, and someone also well, let me get like someone also had pretty good tutorials. Um, so I had that in my home, and it was basically hand coded. I was going to use one of the Tailwind um UI, but you had to pay for it, and it was pretty expensive. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. Um, but so where is that? At? That was my component. So was my was my app on my phone. Um, which one was it? Yeah. So yeah, it was my home. So basically, just inline CSS for that, and also using day FNS. Oh, day JS. Excuse me. I was going to use FNS, but JS would work better, and so. Just kind of using that functionality um, for the calendar. Um, and there's also this util that really helps. So this one was kind of pre-made. Someone actually made this. So this was like using the filter. Um, forgot exactly how it works, to be honest, but um, it really helped because this was one of the, like, the big problems that I was trying to figure out, just basically how to like filter through. Um, but yeah, then actual calendar code was basically yep. So it was day it was day j day js was the main um kind of v to react um like third party or function that I use for the for the calendar. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, you're you're really like building the calendar kind of from from scratch there. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank everyone. I don't think... Yeah. If you didn't go, everyone, everyone's got to call you out. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, those are really nice. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I know there are a couple of hiccups with the demos, but I was surprised how few hiccups there were with the demo. So. That was, Unusually, uh, unusually good. All right. Um, so yeah, we'll just uh, let's take a break. Let me stop.
Yes.